The appeal to authority is the use of authoritative imagery to lend the appearance of credibility to a product. Quite often, this means a picture of someone in a white lab coat. Instant credibility! Other examples of authority-based marketing gimmicks include celebrity endorsements and mentions of certifications, colleges, academies, and institutes. Good science presents good data. It never needs to resort to hokey marketing gimmicks to impress you and is almost never presented with a white lab coat. Beware of any product or idea that is said to be based on ancient wisdom. In ancient times, very little useful or true information was known about human anatomy and many other sciences. Since those days, scientists have learned entire encyclopedias of information about our universe and our bodies. It's completely illogical and backwards to think that the ancients had a better understanding of anything than modern science. Their hearts were in the right place, but in ancient times we simply didn't yet have the tools developed over the subsequent centuries of learning. That's why ancient wisdom gave us things like the flat earth theory, human sacrifice, slavery, a 30-year average human lifespan, rain dances, the burning of witches, and the medical technique of bloodletting to rebalance the four basic bodily humors. But alternative therapies based on ancient wisdom have stood the test of time, haven't they? Well, it doesn't matter how long a treatment has been around. The only criteria medical science has for a treatment is, does it work? We don't care whether the ancient Chinese believed it, we only care about the test results. When you hear any product advertised as being based on ancient wisdom, it's probably because they have no real evidence to support their claims. Ancient wisdom should always be a red flag. Confirmation bias is what we call our tendency to remember events that coincide with our beliefs and don't take notice of events that don't. This is why you can walk out of an hour-long session with a psychic who asked 200 questions, made 300 probing guesses, of which maybe 10 were close to meaningful, and say, wow, she knew everything about me. Many hospital workers think that a full moon means a crazy night in the ER. They all remember those crazy nights when there was a full moon, thus confirming the belief. But they tend to forget the crazy nights when there wasn't a full moon. The data shows that full moon nights are no busier than any other, but we believe the myth because of confirmation bias. Many people will often confuse correlation with causation. If you happened to take an herbal supplement around the same time your cancer went into remission, you're likely to think the supplement caused the remission. We confuse correlation with causation. Here's a valid correlation. People who eat a lot of rice tend to have black hair. I think we can all come up with perfectly logical reasons why these two things happen to go together, but fortunately, I don't think too many of us think one causes the other. Here's another valid correlation. Autistic children are often diagnosed shortly after receiving their regular vaccinations. The reason for this correlation is simply that vaccination age just happens to be about the same age that autism symptoms become apparent. But many people have wrongly drawn a causal relationship, and look at all the trouble that's resulted. Some people are actually preventing their children from getting vaccinated, due to a lack of critical thinking, an irresponsible promotion of alarmism and misinformation by the media. Correlation is not necessarily causation. A red herring is a distraction from following a logical line of evidence. In the old days, if a bloodhound was on your trail, it was believed that dragging a red herring across your path would distract the bloodhound off your scent. Red herrings, therefore, are irrelevant pieces of information thrown into an argument to distract you from the real topic. Red herrings are a favorite of conspiracy theorists. If you listen to the people who try to convince us that September 11th was perpetrated by our own government, their evidence consists of virtually nothing but red herrings. Who crashed the planes into the buildings? Well, Dick Cheney had business interests in the Middle East. Maybe so, but who crashed the planes into the buildings? Well, the leaseholder had an insurance policy on his skyscrapers. Maybe so, but who crashed the planes into the buildings? 
George Bush's younger brother Marvin was a principal in a security company, and the World Trade Center was one of their clients. Maybe so, but who crashed the planes into the buildings? Brian Dunning visited the World Trade Center only two years before they collapsed. And isn't it interesting that he did a podcast episode debunking 9-11 conspiracy claims? Red herrings. These are irrelevant distractions that do not in any way address the point under discussion. They merely have the appearance of relevance because some of the names or places are the same. Be on the lookout for them and be the bloodhound that keeps his nose on the trail. While we're on the subject of conspiracy theorists, let's talk about their other favorite device. It's called proof by verbosity, and it consists of laying out huge volumes of information, more claims and allegations on more subjects about more people and ideas than anyone could ever possibly respond to. Such a blizzard of information gives the appearance of being comprehensive and thoroughly researched. If they have all that amazing amount of evidence, their claim must be true. But it's not the quantity of information that matters, it's the quality of information. You can stack cow pies as high as you want, they won't turn into a bar of gold. Pointing out that the evil government fluoridates our water supply does not support the claim that a particular brand of magically ionized water cures cancer. It makes no difference whether it's true or not, it's irrelevant. Piling on red herring after red herring will never amount to useful evidence. Pay attention and soon you'll run into another claim supported with proof by verbosity. It might be another conspiracy theory. It might be an advertisement for a new type of water with medicinal properties. It might be an herbal product claiming to detoxify your body. Look at all the wild claims they make and take careful note of how many of them are actually directly relevant and specific enough to be testable. Notice how it would be impractical to try and respond individually to each of these many claims. It's an endless game of whack-a-mole. The only way to win? Don't play. Virtually every pseudoscientific claim credits some form of energy. Life force, chi, negative energy, positive energy, the body's energy fields. All meaningless nonsense which sound plausible simply because they throw in a scientific sounding word, energy. New Age practitioners seem to think that energy is a hovering, glowing cloud that can go wherever it's needed and from which adepts can draw power and feel rejuvenated or accomplish healings. Imagine a vaporous creature from the original Star Trek series and you have a good idea of what New Agers think energy is. Energy is a measurement of something's ability to perform work. Given this context, when spiritualists talk about your body's energy fields, they're really saying nothing that's even remotely meaningful. Here's a good test. When you hear the word energy used in a spiritual or paranormal sense, substitute the phrase measurable work capability. Does the usage still make sense? There's a good reason you don't hear medical doctors or pharmacists talking about energy fields. It's meaningless. This is usually a really frail excuse for why mainstream scientists don't take their claim seriously, why the product is not approved by the FDA, or why scientific journals won't publish their articles. You'll often hear this in the form of a conspiracy of the medical establishment to suppress a quack cure because it's in the interest of the medical industry to keep you sick. In fact, any doctor or pharmaceutical company that could develop a new cure would make a fortune. They'd never suppress it. The same goes for auto manufacturers worldwide who are said to be suppressing new efficient engine technologies. As much as some people with particular ideological agendas would like you to believe it, science never suppresses good science. As we've seen time and time again, by no definition can all natural mean that a product is safe or healthy. I'm standing next to a gigantic stand of poison oak. Consider other all-natural compounds like hemlock, mercury, lead, toadstools, box jellyfish neurotoxin, asbestos, not to mention a nearly infinite number of toxic bacteria and viruses, E. coli, salmonella, bubonic plague, smallpox. 
for those natural compounds that are not harmful, synthetic versions have been engineered in many cases to make them even safer, more effective, or able to be produced in large quantities. All natural? Often that's a great thing. Just as often, it's not. Some claimants suggest that it's moral, ethical, or politically correct to accept their claims, to redirect your attention from the fact that they may not be scientifically sound. In some cases, such as the anti-vaccine or anti-fluoridation activists, proponents try to use the court system to force their beliefs to be adopted in place of what we've learned through science. Generally, when a theory is scientifically sound, even if it's brand new, it will eventually find its way into the educational curriculum. Good science is done in the lab, not in the courts, not in protest marches, not in blogs, and not on Oprah. A political or cultural campaign to legalize or promote some product or claim is a major indicator that it's